You know, the other day, um, I attended a funeral for a, a man I had never met, right? But, you know, out of the support and the love that I have for, for people near and dear to me, I went because out of support to them and to comfort them, I, you know, I wanted to show support. But I'll be honest with you, right? Even though I had never met this individual, I wish I had the opportunity uh, to get to know this man who was an example, an inspiration to so many. You know, at this funeral, at this memorial service, person after person talked about the great influence this person had in their lives. They talked about his legacy, the things that he had left behind. But most importantly, how much he loved Jesus. You know, when, when we talk about funerals, funerals in general for Christians at least shouldn't be like just this day of, of, of sadness and mourning. But we really go to, to celebrate life because we know that in our hearts and because of our faith that Heaven has welcomed in one of his own, right? That God has called his, his child home. And I know that the idea of losing somebody near and dear is tough, right? There is a lot of pain that is experienced. And I would imagine that, the, that just the thought of losing a loved one, someone you can't imagine doing life without, is extremely difficult, right? The thought of no longer having someone by your side, especially when you've experienced so much life together, can become such a heavy weight on anyone's shoulder. I don't care how tough you are. It's tough. But one of the beauties, right, one of the silver linings in, in such a moment, right, especially for this individual and being able to celebrate his life, right, was that as these memorable moments and stories revolving around this person's life and this work that he did for the kingdom of God, the thing that inspired me the most is that as, because I like, I like to sit in the back, right? And so I'm sitting in the back, and as these things are being said, right, these great things, I look around, and all these heads are nodding in agreement, right? Person after person echoing amen at, at the things that this person had done. And people even laughing because they could relate. They knew exactly what kind of person this individual was. And this person may have left to be with the Lord, but at the same time, he didn't leave because his life left this lasting imprint in the, in the many lives around him, all around the world, because of the love that Jesus had for him and the love he had for Jesus enabled him, right, enabled those around him to better know, understand, and experience the love of Jesus in their own life. And that, right, and, and, and that, like, I, like there, there's a reason why I share this with you. And that, right, as I try to imagine it, really gives us this minuscule glimpse into the lasting imprint that Jesus left in the lives, of, left in the lives of those around him. And the imprint, the gospel, continues to leave in, the, in all who hear it and receive it and experience it. Right? This, this one sinful individual was able to inspire the masses, just by the life that he lived in, longing after Jesus. And so just imagine, right, the lasting imprint that Jesus has left in the lives of those around him. Think of the lasting imprint that the Jesus has left in the lives of generations past. And then think about your own life. The continual impact, right, the continual imprint that Jesus is leaving in your heart. You see, this morning in our scripture, we have come to this place where Jesus is about to be betrayed. He, he's going to be sentenced to be crucified. And then he's going to die. And it is here that Jesus so famously says, peace, I leave with you my peace, I give to you. And we're actually, we'll dig into that a little bit later. But it's here we see Jesus give so that ultimately the disciples and those that would come after him would be able to live. Right? Jesus gives, right? Jesus lays down his life so that those who choose to put their faith in him can continue living for the gospel. And so by Jesus giving, he is equipping us so that we can essentially get up and go and continue with life. You see, Jesus' death that is slowly creeping up doesn't end with him. Right? We, 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 know, we know the end. We know the results. We, we know the full story. We know that when Jesus dies, it doesn't end him. 
But for a disciple in that moment, right, as these things are progressing, as these things are unfolding, they get to witness the beauty of what, of what Jesus is ultimately alluding to. And so instead, his death ultimately brings about what? Say it with me. Starts with the L, ends with the I. Life. There you go. Good job, right? You know, one of the things that Jesus has been preaching about up until this point is that what will come after him. Right? Jesus is preparing the disciples for his death and his departure, but ultimately he's preparing them so that life would be able to continue post Jesus walking by their side. And for the past couple of weeks, we've talked about the coming of the paraclete, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit, the helper. And after Jesus goes to be with the Father, right, the Holy Spirit will, will come. And once again, the thought of Jesus leaving the disciples has them confused and displaced. And if we've been paying attention, then we can recall that Jesus isn't leaving, leaving them. Right? He may be going to the Father, but I like to think that the impact that Jesus has made in the lives of the disciples, the imprint he has left on their hearts, and the way Jesus has enabled them to live with the arrival of the Holy Spirit would actually magnify, and that in their faith and in their living for Jesus would reach new levels. Because Jesus, as we see, is preparing this way. He is creating this path. And with the power and the guidance and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, those that would choose him would be able to walk down this path, right? Does it make sense? And so, and so because with Jesus' ascension back home, leaves room for the, for the Spirit to come and to take those who know Jesus and confess Jesus, right, to new heights, to experience new things, right, the greater glory of knowing Jesus. You see, Jesus is leaving to give us the Holy Spirit. And what that entails for our lives is an ability to continue living for Jesus, loving Jesus, and living this life until God calls us home. And so this morning, as we navigate through our scripture, let us see what Jesus is giving to his disciples. Let us see what Jesus is giving to us, and let us see how that will impact our continued living for Jesus. And so three things I would like for us to acknowledge and apply this morning. And I know that I, I normally say, let, let's have three, these are three things to prayerfully consider. Like, I, 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 we're not at that point in our scripture, right? We're, we're beyond that. Like, so beyond considering, these are things that I need us to acknowledge. These are three things that I need us to grab onto. And these are three things that I need us to hold onto and to walk this life for Jesus. Can, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you do that for me this morning? Amen? Come on. All right, three things, Okay. The first thing is this, is that the first thing that we have to knowledge or the first thing that we need to come to terms with and realize in our own life by Jesus doing all of these things is that Jesus is giving us the peace of, of Christ, right? Jesus is essentially giving us a peace that can only come from him and him alone. In verse 27, Jesus tells the disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you to you not as the world gives do i give to you let not let not your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid and so here instantly we can see that there are two different kinds of peace right you have, you have the the peace the world knows and has to offer versus the peace that jesus is ready to give when he says my peace i give to you and when we read it as as peace i know it may not sound like much but the word translated from the Hebrew, right, essentially this is from the culture you're coming from, is what? It is shalom. And so within the Jewish culture, shalom meant something so much more than just peace. You know, when we think of peace, we think of, I don't know, like a, like a calmness. That's peace. Serenity. Quietness. Right, when we think of peace, we think of, what, no war. But within the Jewish community, within the Jewish culture, shalom was, was a greeting, right? It was your hi. It was your, your goodbye. It was something that you wished and desired for another person to have and experience. And when you said it to someone else, you wanted them to be filled with this sense of 
peace, right? You wanted them to be filled with shalom, you, that as you, as you welcomed them, you wanted to welcome them with shalom, right? And when you sent them off, you wanted to leave holding on to shalom. So Rabbi Robert Kahn, right, puts into perspective the, the difference between peace and shalom. He says, one can dictate a peace. Shalom is a mutual agreement. Peace is a temporary pact. Shalom is a permanent agreement. One can make a peace treaty. Shalom is the condition of peace. Peace can be negative, the absence of commotion. Shalom is positive, the presence of serenity. Peace can be partial. Shalom is whole. Peace can be piecemeal. Shalom is complete. But in the world, because of sin, shalom was something that was now superficial. Right? It, it, it lost its meaning. It just lost its essence. And we say it, and there's no heart in it. Right? We say shalom, but in reality, I hope you, you, know, I hope you get hurt or whatever. Right? That's the reality of our sinful nature. So even though this sounds good, shalom was something that was broken and misguided because of our sin. The true essence of shalom was incomplete and could not deeply penetrate our lives and make us whole like God had intended, right, his peace. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and to heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And so we are not in a position to obtain shalom ourselves. Shalom isn't something that can come from us wholeheartedly, pure, and complete. Right? We, we can try, but because of sin, it isn't whole in us. It isn't something that we can offer in its entirety to somebody else. It is something that we can and must obtain because of what Christ has to offer Right? You see, Christ is saying, well, I want to give you not the world's peace, but I want to give you my peace. I want to give you my shalom, the very thing that I'm able and capable of doing. Right? Jesus was preparing himself, and he was readying the disciples so that Jesus was, would be able to restore shalom. Just like it was prophesied in the book of Isaiah, where he says, he will be called Prince of Peace, a.k.a. Shalom, and there will be no end of shalom. Right? This is who Jesus has come to be. Right? This is the completed work of Christ that he has set forth to accomplish by, by, by obeying the Father's will. You see, if we look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1, and then if we skip to verse 10, this is what it says. This is what Paul says. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace, right? And this is shalom with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, right? See, this is the work of shalom, right? Restoring what is broken. And we know, right, that in the gospel that only Jesus and Jesus alone is able to do these things, to reconcile to the person most important, and that is whom? That is God the Father, right? He says, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? By his, by his life. And so what we have to understand about Jesus is that when Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you my peace, essentially he's preparing them to what? Ultimately lay down his life. Right? We understand the cross to be something that's going to that's gonna ransom, right? The sin, the debt that is owed. But what we also have to re re remember and realize is shalom is ultimately restoring our relationship to God. Sin creates what in our relationship with God? Chaos. Jesus brings up permanent peace when he offers us his peace. You see here, Paul is further iter iterating that Jesus had restored to wholeness, right, to completeness, right, the broken relationship between humanity and the Father. Jesus was whole, right, complete human that we have been created to be, but because of sin, we fail to be. Right? We cannot be what we need to be right, in order to have shalom. 
Only Christ can bring that. And so by Jesus being our shalom, he is reconciling us. He is restoring us, right? And he is giving, uh, he has, he's given his life as a gift. And it is through this gift that we will be able to, to live. Not just for today, but to live for, you know, until it's time for us to be in eternity with the Father. You see, there is no need for us to be troubled or afraid, just like Jesus says in verse 27. I mean, why? Because God has a plan. Right? Jesus knows what the Father is up to, and he is following the, the Father's plan, right? Because he trusts the Father. Right? That is the presence of shalom that Jesus gives, being present and working in and through our lives. And it is the peace that allows us to experience the joy of the gospel in our lives. And so the second thing that we, as a body of Christ, we as individuals, who I like to think are saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, well, the second thing that we need to acknowledge and grasp and hold on to is that, right, is that by Jesus giving us his shalom, we will be able to experience the joy of faith. All right, so that's number two, right? We will be able to experience the joy of faith. And not only experience it, but continually experience the joy of faith. And so if we take a look at verses 28 to 29, Jesus continues by saying, You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place... You may believe. You see, Jesus has been talking about going to the Father. And, you know, as we've acknowledged many times already, it really isn't sitting right with the disciples. Right? It's, it's, it's bothering them. Right? They're troubled by it. And for good reasons. Right? They don't fully understand what is going on. They're not fully able to comprehend, you know, what, what Jesus is, is alluding to. Right? They're troubled by it. And Jesus' response here. He says, well, if you had loved me, you would have rejoiced by me going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And, and to be honest, Jesus' response is kind of a head scratcher. Like, like, it's like, Jesus, like, what, what do you mean if we had loved you? Isn't it clear? Like, we're, we're, we're here. We're, we're following you. We're, we're, we're doing our best. Like, why would you even question our love for you? And here's the thing that we need to pay attention to. In faith, in their trusting Jesus, in them coming to terms and realizing who Jesus truly was, and Jesus sharing the Father's plan, like, you know, letting them in on the no, they should have rejoiced. They should have rejoiced. Right? For Jesus' sake, for their sake, and for humanity's sake, right? for the fate of humanity, the disciples should have seen this as an opportunity to experience joy. You see, the Father's plan was unfolding before them. They were, they were continued witnesses to it. But the absence of shalom. There was no peace in, in what God was saying. Right? And what Jesus was saying. There was no peace in that moment. Right? Shalom not being there prevented them from being able to experience the joy of their faith. You see, Jesus even says that he's told them so that when everything is said and done, when everything is complete, they would be able to believe. In other words, it doesn't make sense now. But when it's done, right, it'll all make sense. Like when these things unfold and as you see them happen before the, your very own eyes, it's going to turn on like a light bulb when it happens. And that sounds good, right? Like knowing the, the, end, the end plan, knowing the end goal. And if I'm one of the disciples, I think I can understand their, their problem. And that's the in-between. Right? Like we know that God has a plan for our lives. We know that God desires for us to, to do great and amazing things. We know that when all is said and done that we're going to be in eternity, right, in, where there's no more pain, there's no more suffering, right? That, that's the hope, is it not? But what about the in-between? In our knowing, in our final destination, we know that the in-between can be what? It can be painful. It can be trying. It can be chaotic. It can be uneasy. 
And if you're one of the disciples, I imagine that's what's going on. You see, at face value, as you're going through these things, there's nothing joyous about it in the moment, as you're experiencing it, right? Maybe when you exit it, when you take a step back and you reflect, like, yeah, maybe you're able to experience the joy of, of knowing Jesus. But in the moment, as it's happening, it's confusing. And when you're confused, it's really hard to grasp and trust and acknowledge what God is up to in our lives. Think about it. Like, what takes place after this? Judas betrays Jesus. Peter will deny Jesus. They will witness their Savior, their Savior, be ridiculed, mocked, beaten. He's going to look helpless. Right? He's mocked. He's like, if you're the Savior of the world, man, take yourself down from here, right? That's, that's what they say to him on the cross. Not the disciples, but you know, the Roman soldiers, the people who are mocking Jesus. And then what happens? He, he dies on the cross. You see, it's, it's hard to see and experience joy in the suffering as we are going through it. Honest truth. As followers of Christ, we want to be able to. We want to ex- be able to experience joy. But in the moment, it's, it's hard. And I, I like to think that you can relate to what, what I'm saying. But as you're experiencing hardships and the growing pains of faith, it, it can be tough to see and understand God's plan and to be experiencing joy. And so when Jesus says, I'm going to the Father, if their faith had been in the right place, there should have been this joyful anticipation. I go, man, I can't wait to see what God does next. But that wasn't the case. You see, to be able to experience the joy of faith, we must trust whom? Yourself. No. You must trust Jesus. Right? It, it, it doesn't make sense. Like, I don't have no idea what you're doing or how this is going to unfold. But if you don't trust Jesus in that moment, you, you're not going to be able to experience joy. It's going to be so difficult for you to, like, to continue trusting Jesus and living for Jesus. You see, to be able to experience the joy of faith, we must trust Jesus. We must trust God and his plan, even when it doesn't make sense. Even we can't put a finger on it, even when logically speaking, it doesn't add up. But we must trust Jesus, right? In faith, we must trust God in the process as it is unfolding. And we must rejoice in his faithfulness today and tomorrow and as it is continuing. Because we know that even though right now it may not be the greatest thing, we know that God is faithful and he will see us through. And then as we exit out of whatever it is that we're going through, when God's plan is complete or when God shows us what, that, what he's been up to, we can look back and be like, God, that was crazy. God, like, you were so amazing. Like, I cannot believe, like, forgive me just for doubting this a little bit. But, like, God, next time I'm going to trust you a little bit more. Has, has, has God given you a reason to not trust him? Maybe if you're experiencing a, a certain season in your life and, and you're lacking some trust. But I can tell you that if, if you're trusting, if, if your faith is in Jesus as these things are taking place, we have every reason to rejoice. Right? We can rejoice in the good times. But think of, just think of how, how much of a blessing it is to be able to rejoice even in the face of suffering. You see, that's what makes the peace, the shalom that Jesus is leaving with them so, so important. Right, the peace that Jesus is leaving with them will allow them to see the beauty in what has happened and will allow them to rejoice. Right, Jesus says, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you these things now, and then when it happens, you're, you're going to believe. This is what I'm sharing with you, right? That's what he says. And after Jesus' crucifixion, right, Jesus appears to disciples for the very first time. Right, we know the story. But do you remember how Jesus greets them for the very first time? Like, this guy's supposed to be dead. He's supposed to be behind that stone that's rolled and closed off the tomb. Right? And yes, they've heard, they've received word that the, the ladies have went to the tomb and Jesus is gone. Right? They received the word. But do you know how Jesus greets them for the very first time? 
He says, Shalom Alechem. Peace be with you. And in that moment, it may not seem like much to you, but Jesus has said, well, I'm going to leave my peace. My peace I'm going to give to you. And then all of these horrible events transpire. You have the people near and dear to Jesus that betray him. They deny him and they lose hope. And Jesus shows up in your face. Peace be with you. Scripture tells us in John chapter 20, verse 20 to 21. It's, it's, you know, it's, it says that as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and on his side. And get this. It says they were filled with what? Say it with me. They were filled with joy. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. When they saw their Messiah. When they saw their Savior. They were filled with with joy, because guess what? It all made sense. Right? In the moment, man, they had a difficult time trusting God. And they tried. And when Jesus shows up, it just clicks like a light bulb in their, in, in their, in, in their, in their brains and in their hearts. They see the Father's plan being fulfilled, and their reaction is that they are filled with joy. And they're like, man, we had no, no reason to doubt. You see, being greeted by the resurrected Jesus with the very thing he said he was going to give them, shalom. Right? When all hope seemed lost before their very own eyes, they were experiencing the fulfillment of God's plan. Right? They were finally able to experience the fullness of joy because of their faith. Peace be with you was officially restored. This all makes sense. And that brings us to our third, our third thing, our third point, to acknowledge, to grasp, and hold on to, and to take with us. Right, we are beyond the point of consideration. These are things that we need to believe and make our own. And the third thing is this, right? Because of the peace that Jesus is giving us, we will be able to continue our journey of obedience. Right? Because of the peace that Christ is giving us because of, of the peace that Jesus is in our lives, we will be able to continue the journey of obedience. Because when Jesus has given us shalom, we will have the joy of faith with us. We will be able to continue walking in obedience, walking in his statutes, following after Jesus. Right? That's the working of the Holy Spirit in the presence of shalom in our lives. And so in verses 30 to 31, Jesus wraps things up with. I will, no, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. You see, Jesus says that the ruler of the world is coming, but he what? He has no claim on me. And this is important for us to understand because what is about to happen is going to seem like someone else is in control. Right? What Jesus is warning the disciples is that there's, there's, some, there's, there's some events that are going to pop off. Right? Some things is going to happen. And it's going to, and it's going to seem like the Father's plan is spiraling out of control, but that is not the case. He says what? This, he, right, has no claim on me. Right? It's going to seem like Satan has turned the tables. Right? It's going to feel like chaos has ensued and that evil has prevailed. It's going to, it's going to feel like, it's going to seem like, right, to the eye, to the physical eye, to the world, that Jesus is helpless, vulnerable, and a victim in all of this. Remember the words of Jesus. He says, the ruler of this world. Right? The Greek says the prince of this world. We know him to be the prince of darkness. We know he's referring to Satan. We know he is referring to evil. We know he is re re referring to sin. That person and all the things that he is associated with, the things that we think that he has authority over, that has nothing 
on Jesus. Jesus says it has no claim on me and in my head, right, and in my imagination. It's like training day, right, when Denzel Washington so famously says, King Kong ain't got nothing on me. And I imagine that Jesus with the same energy, with the th- same authority is saying that Satan, you're no match for me. You think you're, you're winning, right? You think that you are in control. But you're not. You see, when it seems like God isn't in control in our lives, when it seems like the, the enemy has the upper hand, when it feels like you're, you're losing, when, you, when you're being overly critical of yourself, you know, oh, I'm, I'm so stupid. I'm, I'm such a sinner, right? And you're beating yourself up over and over again. Remember that Satan has no claim on Christ. Or take the cross, for example. It's so easy that in that moment to think that Satan has won, that Satan is in control, and that this is actually Satan's doing. But instead, in actuality, we know that this is God's doing. This is God's sovereignty unfolding before our very own eyes. This is all according to God's plan. And what we are witnessing is Jesus' obedience to the Father's plan. You see, Satan wants you, uh, wants nothing more than for us to think that for a moment, just for a brief moment, it doesn't have to be like the whole thing, but just even for, for a momentary time that God is no longer in control. Right, Satan wants nothing more than for us to take our eyes off the ball and onto something else, thinking that, oh my, oh my we got to figure it out. Like Satan wants you to lose composure. But you have to remember who has the upper hand. Who is in control? Who is following the plan to a T? It's Jesus. Right? Jesus has the upper hand. And because of Jesus' obedience, the Father was always in control. Right? Jesus is in the, the driver's seat. Like Jesus isn't taking a step back, but he's, his foot is on the gas, right? Me, you know, pedal to the metal. Right? Some of you drive like that. Please don't drive like that, all right? But Satan wants to disrupt our faith and our trust because the moment we aren't doing that, what happens? prince of this world wants you to second guess what God is doing. He wants us to trust less. Jesus wants you to trust him. What? More. Jesus wants you to remember the words that he has spoken. He wants you to remember the truths that he has given to you, right? He is laying out the Father's plan so that when we are witnessing it unfold before our very own eyes, that our faith would actually increase, that we would, that we would trust him even more, that we would walk in obedience because we've been here before. We have seen God's faithfulness continue to unfold in our lives time and time again. And so in your life, there are going to be moments where it feels like God is no longer in control. That is not God's doing. That is Satan's doing. Don't believe the lie. Right? If you truly believe that Jesus is your Savior, right, that in Jesus you have shalom, then the enemy has no claim on you. Right? Satan ain't got nothing on you. I know at times it feels like he does. Like he's trying. Believe that. Well, he's trying. Most definitely, he's, he, he's trying. He's, he's trying hard. But you have to remember. You have to hold on to the truth that Satan has no claim on you because you and I, we belong to whom? Jesus. We belong to Christ. In Mark chapter 14, 42, Jesus says, right, even he says it here, he says, rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. When Jesus says, rise, let us go, he is inviting his disciples, he is inviting us to what? To continue 
following him, to continue trusting him. Because in this moment, it seems like this is the end, but it's not, right? The disciples will follow, and it's going to lead to Jesus being betrayed, but God was always in control. Right? The disciples will follow, and it will lead to Jesus' arrest. It'll, we will witness Peter's denial, and it will seem like the enemy is in control, when in reality, God was always in control. Right? Jesus will be crucified, put to death, and it will seem like all hope is lost. But we have to remember, this was the Father's plan, and he was always in control. Can, do you see the theme? Who was, who was in control every single step of the way? It was whom? It was Starts with the G, ends with the odd. It was God. So when Jesus says, rise, let us go, it is not the end. He's not saying, let's get up, man. The story is going to end. He's not saying, let's get up, man. It's, about, it's all about to be over soon. But when Jesus says, rise, let us go, it is the beginning of Forever. It is the beginning of an eternal relationship with God the Father. And we have to remember that, right? That will encourage us to get up and to continue following Jesus in obedience, that knowing that God is in control, that God is always in control. What you and I need to do is to simply trust him every step of the way, even when it doesn't make sense. But we can only do so when we acknowledge and see and understand and experience the shalom that Christ has to offer us. Because Jesus isn't leaving, right, to abandon us, right? Jesus isn't, right, but Jesus is leaving because he is enabling us. He is readying us to continue living because of the great love he has for you and that he has for me. And so when we realize what Jesus has given us, when we begin to experience it and walk in it and, and to carry it with us, all that Jesus has given us or given up will enable us, right? It will empower us to live and the life that we lead will influence those around us for the kingdom of God, right? We will be able to leave an imprint on the hearts of those we get to do life with all while continually pointing to whom? To Jesus. You see, Jesus is, is laying down his life so that we can live. Jesus is giving us his peace because what was once broken can be made whole and complete. See, Jesus has given to us his life so that you would get up and go. So rise up, you and me. Let's go. Let us continue living for Jesus, because this is the beginning to what? To forever. This is the beginning to eternity. And as we get up and go, remember who is in control. It is whom? It's Jesus, right? God is in control. This is what Jesus has given us so that we could experience life with all of these things. Amen? Let us pray.